Hey, it's Empire's Book of the Day. I'm Andrew Limbaugh. In our annual Books We Love guide, I-, I like looking at the books under book club ideas because the right book club book has to be able to spark a conversation point across a wide variety of people, you know, depending on your book club. And there's a lot anyone can relate to in Donald Ryan's novel, The Queen of Dirt Island. It centers around the women in a family living in the early 80s in Ireland, and it's structured in a way where you get these vignettes of their lives. And Ryan tells Empire's Mary Louise Kelly in this interview that he wanted the book to capture the highs and lows of life and also the quotidian stuff in between. You know how one day not much happens, and then the next day someone close to you dies and it's this big major thing, and then the next day is just another Tuesday, because that's how life is. Anyway, that's ahead. This message comes from Apple. Apple Gift Card is a practical gift that unlocks a world of entertainment and fun. You can send it via email or give a physical card to your loved ones, friends, or family. They can use Apple Gift Card to buy Apple products, accessories, apps, and games. But they can also use the funds to pay for music, movies, TV shows, and more. Visit Apple.com for details and to send Apple Gift Cards to your friends and family this holiday season. Donal Ryan's novel, The Queen of Dirt Island, is a love story. Now, I do not mean in the traditional romantic sense. Rather, it's about the love that four generations of women in the Aylward family feel for one another. Beginning in 1982, the novel chronicles the lives of these four women in County Tipperary, Ireland, Mary, Eileen, Saoirse, and Pearl. We glimpse their struggles, their knock-the-walls-down fights, both with outsiders and amongst themselves. We glimpse their commitment to one another. Well, Donald Ryan joins me now from Limerick, Ireland. Welcome to All Things Considered. Thank you, Mary Louise. It's such a pleasure to be here. I want you to begin where the book begins, uh, with the birth of Saoirse, who becomes the narrator. Who is she? And just give us a glimpse of how she comes to be the fulcrum around which this family pivots. Sure. Uh, Saoirse is the daughter of Eileen Aylward, who is pretty much the titular queen of Dirt Island, um, who's based loosely, but quite faithfully in a way, on my own mother. Um, oh, really? And huh. Yeah. And it worked out um, to be a novel that centres women, but not quite by design. I didn't explicitly planned this I didn't say to myself okay you know the men here will be be peripheral and attendant and the women will take centre stage but it just kind of happened it sounds a bit silly but it it was almost a magical process because I wrote the novel very quickly and Sirius's voice and what Sirius witnesses was all very clear to me and came very easily Um, it was probably the easiest book I've written in my shortish career Ah. and when you say yes this is a novel that centres women but I didn't start out planning that it just magically came to be to give me a, give me a little more detail <laughs> when you say it, it just sounds, it sounds crazy yeah. <laughs> is it just women are at the center of, of everything or or how did this how did this come about well i guess so that's the way it's always seemed to me from a young age um because in the 70s and 80s in, in rural ireland in most houses the dads went to work and most houses I knew of, mum stayed at home. Now, my own mum worked in a betting office um, part-time when I was a child, but for the most part, um, I was among women because I had a sister and a mother and a grandmother who often stayed with us, and it seemed that all of the neighbourhood women would congregate in my mum's kitchen during the day. So it's the way it felt, and, you know, I I really drew on the humour and spirit and strength of those women when I was writing this book. Eileen strode through my imagination and kind of gave the orders and told me what to do. You also imagine all kinds of horrible things happening to your characters, starting with the death of the man who is the husband of one and the son of one and and the father of of the third of your main female characters. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm curious what that was like, imagining taking, it sounds like a place inspired by this very safe central place in your own life, and then imagining, well, what if everything had spun in all kinds of different directions? Exactly. I mean, I made a pact with myself years ago when I started to write seriously. I decided I was going to try to narrow the distance between the reader and what they were reading as much as possible. I was going to try to draw on the best and worst parts and all of the variegations in between of life. And so I wasn't going to shy away from the darkness, from the the awful things that befall people. Because life is so fragile. No. Um, I thought, you know, I'm going to try to have something in here that's, that's, that bends towards that lovely 
kind of dark, scathing Irish humour on, on, in every chapter, if possible. And I think it comes true mostly, I think, from Nana, to be honest. She, she's kind of a, the grandma. a raucous mm-hmm. character. Yeah, I love her. <laughs> she, she seems like she might have been the most fun to write. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I have to say, I mean, I, I do love the character of Nana. And, you know, for me, she encompasses the whole book. Um, and when I think of the book, I think pretty much of Nana's face and her voice and what she's saying. She became so real while I wrote. And I wrote um, an article recently that was published on LitHub and I talked about how it seemed as though there was a ghostly disembodied voice whispering inspiration in my ear for the whole 12 weeks of the writing of the first draft. And I think that voice was Nana's, um, for sure. 12 weeks. Um, And this book is, the version I'm looking at, is pushing 250 pages. That's an extraordinarily fast writing pace. Yeah, I was kind of in a panic. Um, No, I didn't, I wasn't panicking during the act of writing, but I had spent the previous two years, I'd spent all of my writing time composing a much longer and much darker novel that spanned a man's lifetime. And I described it as a a hellscape because he is coming to terms with some awful acts he's committed. And so it's a series of confessions. But I was genuinely convinced during the writing of it that this was the best thing I'd ever written. But I was very gently and kindly disabused of that notion by my publisher and editor when I sent the manuscript in. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, but they did say that they would publish it, but it would have to be radically changed. And I hadn't, I genuinely did not have the heart to go near that book again. And I thought, you know, I could write another book. And I sat at my desk thinking, but I don't have an idea. I've got nothing. All I've got is the residue and the, the <laughs> dim, dark echo of this long novel. Yeah. And literally it felt as though I looked up through the skylight and it felt as though a voice came from heaven and said, what about a house full of women? Wow. You also, if I can just touch briefly on the structure of the book, it's very short chapters. I don't think there's a single chapter that's more than two two pages. They're all like a page and a half, one word titles to each of the chapters. I'm curious why you wrote it that way. It felt to me almost like you were giving me um, a family photo album. You weren't going to tell me what happened every single day, every single minute, but you would give me these snapshots and... And each chapter felt just like a poof, there goes the flash. Here's what you see now. And it allowed me to fill in what might be happening in between. Was that intentional? Oh, that's a lovely way of putting it, Mary Louise. Thank you. And it was. I mean, the main reason for the f- each chapter is actually exactly 500 words. Um, no more, no less. Literally, each chapter is exactly 500 words. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Um, and I, I, it, 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 I know it sounds arbitrary, but it started to make sense because the first few vignettes I wrote worked out at around 500. And I thought, just for tidiness here, I'll clip these back to exactly 500 so I can keep a very, very close eye on the construction of it. I can keep, you know, I I can use a very, if I used a very strict modular approach, I thought, I won't veer off track, I won't digress too much, um, and I can keep a real control on the pacing of it. And it really worked. Um, But really, I thought as well, um, it's natural. This is a natural thing, because every day is one revolution of the earth um, is the exact same length and some days are just ordinary days where you go to work and not much happens and it's a nice pleasant day and other days are the day that one of your parents dies or you lose somebody you love or you get married or you know or you meet the love of your life or your child is born some days are huge and some days seem tiny but every day is the exact same length and so to have these vignettes that sometimes contain a lot of action and sometimes contain just somebody thinking something it seemed natural and right I love that. And I can't let you go without asking what happened to the giant, dark, hellscape novel. It's still here on my hard drive. Um, actually, I printed out a copy from my mom not too long ago, and she actually really likes it. I think she prefers it to the Queen of Dart Island, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, Donald Ryan, thank you for coming and sharing this novel, which I'm so glad you wrote and put out in the world. And thanks for coming and talking to us about it. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Mary Louise. His new novel is The Queen of Dirt Island. That's it for this week on NPR's Book of the Day. Let us know what you think. You can write to us at bookoftheday at npr.org. And just a reminder that you can sign up for Book of the Day Plus, which allows you to listen to Book of the Day without any sponsor breaks, and you'll be supporting our books coverage at NPR. You can find out more at plus.npr.org slash bookoftheday. And a big thank you to everyone who has already signed up. I'm Andrew Limbong. The podcast is produced by Isabella gomez Armiento and Ashley Montgomery and edited by Megan Sullivan. Our founding editor is Petra Mayer. 
The show elements for this week were produced and edited by Adam Rainey, Alejandra Marquez Hansa, Ryan Bank, Melissa Gray, Emiko Tamagawa, Todd Munt, Samantha Balaban, Edwin Knolte, Elena Burnett, and Courtney Dorning. Beth Donovan is our managing editor. Thanks for listening. Humans spent the 20th century making nature do what we wanted. In the 21st, we're now trying to undo the damage. Decades into the push to fix Florida's Everglades, it's still a tug of war between money, power, and climate. Listen to WLRN's Bright Lit Place from NPR. Support for this podcast and the following message come from South Carolina Federal Credit Union. Folks listening to this in a vehicle they're tired of owning are in luck. South Carolina Federal provides auto loans that could help reduce the costs of commutes and road trips. And there's no payment due for 90 days after closing. To learn more about how fast, friendly financing can get drivers behind the wheel and out on the road, visit scfederal.org. Loans subject to approval. Certain restrictions apply. Support for this podcast and the following message come from South Carolina Federal Credit Union, a member-owned financial institution serving six major markets across South Carolina. Their warm, welcoming, and friendly staff are eager to help you turn your financial dreams into a reality. South Carolina Federal Credit Union invites you to become part of their family today. Learn more at scfederal.org, insured by NCUA.